overall theme of this course of study. We're looking at ways in which um, social inconsistencies, particularly poverty and the difficulties that evolve out of poverty, how they affect urban mental health. My contention is that a large number, a large percentage of persons who live in urban networks, in districts of urban networks that are mostly of color, tend to radiate a very high level of mental illness that has never been, and perhaps never will, be treated as such. It's rather easy to take poverty and to blame it for all of the social in inconsistencies that we have within American society. That would be unfair, because not all impoverished situations are negative. Um, you look at the many families that have survived because of hard work and commitment to one another and to their community. And then we look at people who have ended up extremely successful, who are products of uh, very difficult environments uh, growing up. Uh, so poverty just in itself does not create negativity. Negativity is created because persons do not have an empowerment which will permit them, in spite of the fact that they are very poor, to control their environment. I think controlling one's environment is very, very important for the success that one will have in life. Or how you see your environment being controlled by other positive people within that environment. So the thing we need to avoid is blaming poverty on every miscreant uh, element there is in our society. Because that, again, that would be uh, really unfair. But to say that poverty has its linkages in most of the social inconsistencies that we experience, that answer would be correct. Uh, so what I'm going to ask you to do today is to respond as well-informed students about how this can be broached and how it can be controlled. Now listen to this, so it's not very long. You can see I've got about two minutes of reading here, but I'm going to read it very slow because I put this out of the paper um, about three months ago. It deals with the, the, the whole question of national poverty, uh, of all of the states of the United States, where is their poverty level at, and what is being done to affect it. Well, this, uh, I, I didn't put that in there, but I did put the part, the last part, that deals with the, the community that you're now in. And let's utilize that whatever community you go to, whether you go home or whether you go to another area to begin your professional work, um, just in your mind, just picture you being in this community and having to face these things. Now, it's rather staggering, because you think of Rochester as a well-to-do city, uh, conglomerate uh, industrialization, uh, many, many, many opportunities for education and so forth. But reading now the tail end of this article, Rochester continues to be the fourth poorest city in the United States among the top 75 metropolitan areas, the top three being Detroit, that's in Michigan, of course, Cleveland in Ohio, and Dayton. That's a surprise to me in Ohio. Cleveland and Detroit are not. Among the 10 poorest United States cities, poorest, Rochester continues to rank fourth, primarily because of its childhood poverty. The childhood 
childhood poverty rate in Rochester is high and is continually escalating. Rochester now ranks third for the rate of people living in extreme poverty, moving up from fifth. To put Rochester's poverty rate into context, the January 2015 report, I don't have the 2016 statistics yet, but the January 2015 report, which ended at the end of 2014, compared the city statistics to a list of 18 principal cities in similar sized metro areas within 200,000 of the Rochester population. Included in the benchmark group are Buffalo, Hartford, Connecticut, Richmond, Virginia, Birmingham, Alabama, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Louisville, Kentucky, and Honolulu, Hawaii. The census data found for this benchmark group that Rochester now ranks first in overall poverty edging ahead of Hartford, and it continues to rank first in childhood poverty and extreme poverty, Rochester. Our community's battle against poverty is not about simple solutions or quick fit fixes. And that statement from Jennifer Leonard, who is the Rochester Area uh, Community Foundation representative. Now, how does that grab you, Rochester, this city? Right? The city, with, with, with how many universities do we have? We have Rochester, we have St. John Fisher, we have Nazareth, we have one of the best, matter of fact, among the top five two-year colleges in the nation, Monroe Community College. How do we, how, how can we equate that? Childhood poverty being number one, Extreme poverty being number one, when ranked with all these other cities. Okay, I need to have feedback from y'all. Y'all the ones who want to have to deal with this. You, you're, you're sure, I apologize. I ask for forgiveness. My generation didn't do it, but it was on you all to eradicate all of this. All right, Ms. Martin. Um, I think we, um, I know the U of R tries to employ <clears throat> a lot of like Rochester community members. Um, whether it's through like the like service workers or the um, like dining services, but I think we need to continue to do outreach in that sense to like employ people in the community so that this institution, like especially the U of R, this institution that's taking all of this money and bringing these privileged students into this area needs to help the area that it's in. Well, employment certainly. Uh, very important. That's an acute need. Um, I think, though, conspicuous from its absence on this report, in dealing with children, poverty rate, uh, what is left out is the, really, I think, the precarious situation facing public education directly in the city. I think it has some kind of overlap. Uh, so does lead paint poisoning. Lead paint has found its way back into poor housing and children being victimized because they chew it. And when they stand by window sills and chew the chip paint, it causes pica, P-I-C-A, and pica can work its way into the brain and cause um, retardation. And pica is difficult to eliminate because it's like sugar cane. The more you chew it, the sweeter it becomes. So parents are not aware of that and as a result of it, numbers of children are affected. But all of these things play into the whole social impoverishment of a community. But that's a major, that's a major one. Uh, there are several areas in the city. Um, does any, have any of you ever been to Village Gate here? Not going in New York City. Village Gate here? Well, we have a section called Village Gate very attractive for middle and upper class people because of its restaurants, shops, things like this. Um, <laughs> oddly, right behind it there is a mental health agency. Um, but um, if you go over there, 
you go to the left or to the right, that's to the east and to the west, you'll see huge buildings, which at one time were industrialized giants for the city. They're vacant. The windows are knocked out, some are boarded. Uh, no one has ever moved back in. Uh, it was a place, obviously, of thriving business, which gave economic stability to the community that it served. But everything is gone now. You go over there, it's like a ghost town. Railroad track goes by. It's, it's still active, of course. Amtrak uses that uh, particular railway. And people come in from all over to go to Village Gate to shop and to eat. A lot of the uh, yuppies eat their lunch there. Uh, they have several nice restaurants. Uh, when those industries move, when those large corporations move out, there is nothing to replace them. The number of people that they hired who were from the community were, of course, uh, the heaviest benefits uh, of that institution other than um, other institutions that they serve for parts and whatnot. But it is a very difficult situation that is triplicated throughout the, the world, throughout this country. Uh, when businesses leave, who takes their place? Uh, good question. That, that, that unemployment, boom, right at the top, yes. Um, I know a lot of the buildings over there have asbestos and some other issues like well, I work at a building over there and like they wanted to move for a while but nobody will obviously buy it because all the money it would take to get mm -hmm. the asbestos out and um, do other repairs to that larger building so it's unfortunate that the city can't um, subsidize that. Subsidizing is it's difficult to do in, in some of those areas because it takes so much money to um, reincorporate them. And some businesses are uh, snake bitten because uh, they know the history of the area. Poverty still exists over all around it. Um, the city at one time sought to sell the buildings to churches or community people. You know, for how much? A dollar. You know how many buildings they sold? None. None that I know of. Uh, I, I was friends with a minister who uh, he and his congregation had fixed on a big empty warehouse in that area, but uh, it cost so much to renovate it, it would uh, drive them broke. So they decided not to do it, that they wait for church to develop, which it did. Good, good thing that they waited. But you're looking at thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars to renovate forsaken buildings. Um, so that's a major problem. And uh, it adds to the decline of the community because it's an eyesore. The city does nothing, in some cities, does nothing to uh, eliminate eyesores. And that's a major thing. If you're looking for a house to buy, uh, you're not going to go into an area where everything is an eyesore. No, you don't want that. You want to move into some place that's nice, well taken care of, and you have responsible people. But uh, you know, oftentimes you don't get that. You get nothing, actually. I was going to say the other problem with a lot of the houses that are kind of dilapidated like that and other buildings, um, so it, I mean, generally it takes the city like many years to actually get around to demolishing them, mm -hmm. um, but even when they do, so now they're, um, I was just talking about this yesterday in a class, which is why I know this, but there are around like 2,500 um, abandoned lots in the city right now, mm -hmm. um, which if you, when you go down a lot of the streets, like some of them, you know, some of the nicer ones have been turned into like like urban gardens or other like things like and that's been like really an improvement in the area but a lot of them are just a, kind of sitting there um and a lot of the problem more with like the lead paint is that when the city just comes in and demolishes the building um the lead paint just gets like they don't clear it out so it just it just goes and then it gets stuck in the ground and it's just like this continual cycle so then you don't know if you can actually eat like you could test the ground before you can build on it and it's like this you know awful keeps on going <laughs> that's right uh, and that's not very optimistic now this whole this whole question of village gate um it was a series of large buildings connected almost what they did 
was that several entrepreneurs got together, including people involved in the restaurant business, and they just invested in it. And what they did, by a whole lot of conglomerates coming together, uh, they were able to clean it up and to petition it off. Restaurant here, clothing area there, and it's amazing what they did. And some independent uh, companies, such as bookstores, who were in the community, they moved in and they rented space. And as a result, now that's still it's a very nice place to go. But once you leave it, you 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 run uh, directly into all of this poverty that's, that surrounds it. And nothing that they have done uh, at Village Gate, the owners have they have done nothing to kind of beautify or at least to uh, make it more of an attractive venue for persons who are coming in. People go in, they, when they leave, they leave quickly simply because there's nothing else. Nothing else. Uh, but that's one thing. That takes jobs away from people who need employment most. Now, what are... <coughs> yes, bless you. What are some other incidents now that you left? Yes, Mr. West. Um, I feel like for me, education is a big one. Uh -huh. Because in order to actually make the community better, you have to start with the children. Yes, you do. Because unfortunately, for some of us, our parents weren't able to break the cycle, but we were. And now that the cycle is broken, it's because we have an education and we can go out and help the community. But also, sometimes when we break the cycle, we forget where we come from. That's what a lot of people don't do. We don't go back to our communities. We go, we buy a nice house in a nice neighborhood, and we like leave forever. Mm -hmm. So I feel like education, the system has to be revamped. For me, like personally, like um, I only had problems with like schools since like coming up here, like because of your skin color or mm -hmm. my skin color. Like I didn't know learning why black was a thing until like I came to U of R. Because like when I'm in Trinidad, everyone, you know, you're white, you're black, you're Indian, you're all Trinidadian. So up here, it was just like a struggle for me for a while to mm -hmm. figure out that like, okay, I'm black and this is going to affect me, right? Because in middle school and high school, I went to school with. Like, yeah, but that's because the racial caste in this mm -hmm. country that started with the enslavement of African people mm -hmm. has maintained itself psychologically mm -hmm. and it still affects people who can't uh, overcome that issue. Um, now, thank you, you mentioned something though, uh, yes, there are some who find success when you go out. No. Do they abandon the community that gave them birth? Do they abandon the community that their first associations of life are found? How do you, how do you deal with that? Who is Is there a responsibility on the part of those who have lived in a situation, but have bettered themselves. Is there any responsibility of people such as that coming back to lend a hand? All right, Ms. Martin. So I have two things about that. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing is it's super important to have at least input from people who like have come from that area, yes. whether or not they still live there, mm -hmm. but like you need people who are culturally competent and you can't be culturally competent if you've never lived there. And like that's a huge thing in all like public health work. It's a huge thing in like all like development work and stuff like that. But also when you if you end up still living there, like, do your kids fall back into that cycle? Mm -hmm. Like how do you make sure that you like your kids don't get stuck in the cycle that you finally broke? You know or, I mean? Like, what if it's the opposite? Like, if you want to maintain that culture. Like, my friend told me about this Netflix show called Blackish, mm -hmm. where it's like they moved out of the ghetto or whatever, but they're still having trouble trying to maintain the culture of their children because they go to school in the suburbs and, like, the son came home and he was like, Oh, Dad, I want to play field hockey. And he's <laughs> like, Field hockey? Why don't you want to play basketball or something? So it's like, it's like there's backlash either way you go. Mm -hmm. like. So it's like a lose-lose situation, kind of, but I don't know. No, two things. Number one, getting back, I should have mentioned this earlier, the anti-poverty initiative started by Monroe County have no poor people in it. They just have people in it who are successful and make all kind of money, and they're going, how can, no, no. 
No, go back to the table. You have to include, you said it, you have to include people who are yet living in that situation. They know exactly what's needed, what is needful. Now, secondly, um, this is not only an issue facing poor black people, poor Latino people. It is an issue that most immigrant groups have faced at one time or another since they're coming to this country. Italian, Polish, Hungarian, Ukrainian, and probably more than that, uh, majority Roman Catholic, most of them did not send their children to public schools because of that fear and were part of the movement that established parochial schools. That meant that their children would get a Catholic education. They were Catholic. That means that their moral teaching will remain intact. They, they couldn't depend upon public schools to do that, although public schools should be considered as being a moral institution from that time forward. Uh, but that's how some, some of the schools were started. That's how some Jewish schools were started. The Hillel, the Hillel tradition. Uh, that's how some schools were uh, started by right-wing evangelicals, kind of, so to speak. I don't want to, I can only say right-wing. Not, I'm not saying that derisively. I'm saying just to identify it from being centrist and identify it from being leftist. But it's right-wing started evangelical Christian schools on the same premise that Catholic parents were behind the promulgation of Catholic schools. So these things maintain themselves. But there's no reason why public schools cannot be traditionally enforced by its environment as over against uh, not being so. But all of this does, does play a major role, plays a major, major role. Let me tell you something that Buffalo is doing. I'm hopeful about this because, in a sense, they're finding out that charter schools are not the answer. The Buffalo, Buffalo State University has incorporated a program where they will take graduating seniors from Buffalo schools who are poor, from poor neighborhoods, whether they be, no matter what race they are, if they identify as an impoverished families, they will train these young people for two years independently in um, very uh, social, uh, social stuff. If the students prove to be academically successful and apt, they will then provide them with a four-year free of charge, free tuition, right down the line, scholarship. However now, that is conditional. After a successful graduation with a degree in elementary or secondary education, they have to go back to where they came from for five years and work within the school system. Um, to me, that makes a whole lot of sense. And I'm, I'm more visual, I'm more of an idealist as, as I get older now. I, I, I see things as, I, as, as some things that are ideal rather than actual. But that, that, that is something that I think could work. If you get the right kind of people, especially young people involved, who really want to make a difference, who are bright enough to understand the situation, receive the training, that's only six years. If you're 18, six years, you're 24. Good heavens. You're awfully, awfully, awfully young. And you can do a lot of things at 23, 24, and 25 years of age that people 60 and 65 just cannot do because they have the consciousness and they have the vision and they have the energy to put it into place. Yeah, Ms. Martin and then um, Ms. Dingo. Um, I don't know the conditions of it, like the specific conditions of it, but the University of Pittsburgh provides um, a similar scholarship to Pittsburgh City School District uh -huh. students. Um, so a lot of my friends that came from like the very rural area that I'm from mm -hmm. had a lot of trouble getting financial aid because the they, they allocate a lot of their financial aid to giving Pittsburgh City School District students like almost free or free tuition. I'm not sure like how it works, but I think that's one of the ways that they're trying to like 
accomplish something similar to that because um, like the inner city school districts, no matter what city you're in, you're gonna have like yeah. students. It's wide open. Mm -hmm. one, one city does it, uh, it, it, it helps that city. Mm -hmm. That's what it, that, that's, that, that, that's what it helps. Does it help the massive number of communities that we have that are suffering the same kind of situation? But if one city can prove to be effective, it can be used as a model for other cities to uh, duplicate or try to duplicate. Because everywhere you go, you have thousands of children in school, thousands of them. So how to uh, equate their education with excellence, that's a question that um, has to be addressed in order for the whole poverty situation to be uh, dealt with. Um, one interesting thing is that in South Africa, um, so all of the university is free besides like like some like smaller payments, but like university in general is free in South Africa. And so any um, medical student, like their first two years of service need to be in townships or in like other like rural areas, except um, so all of the universities last semester were on strike, like pretty much all of them in South Africa um, to, uh, there's like university like fees, which isn't like tuition, but like to lower fees to make it more accessible to like black and colored students. And um, so they were all on strike and to try and like decolonialize de their education system, except because they were a semester behind, they, the universities, a lot of them had to like just close for the entire year, which means that there's an entire year of people who would be graduating medical school who aren't graduating medical school. And so the people who are in their second year of this service are going to leave, and in the first year they're going to go to second year. But there's going to be an entire like half of the people who should be treating people in townships and in the small like rural villages that just like there won't be doctors there anymore because the universities couldn't graduate their class of medical school students. And so like these programs are super effective, assuming everything's running smoothly. But now because the, the university closed for uh, a year. Like half of these places just straight up won't have doctors because it's not lucrative for doctors who are like further along in their career to go and work there. And so unless it's like unless it's uh, they are like, 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 um, so a lot of the organizations. I don't mean to like keep interrupt you, but um, there's an organization that's called like Shaco or mm -hmm. something. It's a volunteer organization and it works with UCT students. Mm -hmm. And like I'm gonna volunteer for it when I go there. That's the only reason I know all of these things. I've been like looking it up. Um, but they'll take medical students to okay. work in these like rural clinics and stuff as well. So I, it's like not obviously not as quality care, mm -hmm. but there's still like some something. Yeah. They're taking like nursing students and like um, medical students and public health students to like you yeah. know help with these clinics. Yes, yeah, there's like large scale clinics in a lot of these right. townships because the townships have like millions of people in them, and it's, so if you are assuming you're gonna get a thousand doctors in a year and you get like 200 medical school students like it's not here we are yeah well there are two things to that um, number one i was in um, south africa right after apartheid it must have been 98 i was there the lot one of the largest hospitals i was told in the world is located uh in the soweto Areas of township, all black township, at least it was then, from uh, uh, Johannesburg. And the reason why it's so large is that black patients were not seen, many of them at the regular so called white hospitals in Johannesburg. So they had this huge um, hospital. I, I, I saw, I just made my mind with a large hospital, and I was told by the guide um, how it came to be. But um, yes, if you get, we were talking about a university hospital. I was born in a university hospital, Ohio State University Hospital, that's what it was called. It was called just plain university hospital now, but that's where most of the poor, poor people were born, poor children were born um, in a, a hospital um, controlled by the university, which really provided close to free health care uh, for, for poor families. Um, you didn't happen to be really poor, but to get help, but you, you had to be identified somewhat as that. Now, the other thing is, uh, Ms. Martin, you're going to volunteer um, 
And Mr. Dingus said that the number of treating physicians quite low in some areas. Um, all over the world, with the exception of this country, and maybe I'm not too sure about Latin South and Central America, but all over the world, there's a group of doctors called Doctors Without Borders, and they are very facilitated in going into areas where there is no, uh, or little or no medical uh, help for people uh, to really try to bridge that gap. Now, this has gotten to be politically dangerous, though, for them. There was a time when they weren't really bothered that much by outside forces, but now politically some of those areas are rather dangerous to go into, and there have been reports of some uh, people involved in uh, Doctors Without Borders being executed uh, simply because of uh, where, where they're at. This is terrible. But anytime you think in terms of volunteering into an area of destitution, uh, outside of this country, you're going to run into some kind of political conflict from time to time. Doesn't necessarily mean danger, but it does uh, require caution. So be sure that you know where you're going. My daughter, for about five years, is a part of this Teach America, and she went to uh, Af uh, she went to Thailand, she went to Mozambique in Africa. Uh, and then she called me and told me she was going to Costa Rica. I said, no, you are not. That's enough, it is enough, it is enough. She went to three countries doing this Teach America thing. English for a second language, this, that, and the other. And I said, no, no. That's when I started praying for her to meet somebody. I said, Lord, let that child meet somebody. Let her get married. And that's what happened. <laughs> married now with two boys. So I'm, uh, but she, she t now she... She teaches yoga, and she said that she makes more money teaching yoga. When she was teaching, she made $83,000 a year in Brooklyn. Um, now that she's yeah. teaching yoga privately, she says she's making, yeah, she's making, and that was, a, that was a, her incoming salary, $83,000 a year. Yes. And uh, her husband worked at the same place. Taught, he taught music there, so mm -hmm. that's where they met. What was she teaching? Music, music, uh, oh, instrumental music, music, and music, all, all, everything on the arts for him. He's a graduate of a music, uh, college music department, plays trombone, uh, trombone major. Uh, but she says she's doing good now. Uh, she has to drive a lot, but she says she's doing good. And I said, well, that's better than being in areas where it's very unpredictable at this point. You know? so I'm kind of relieved of that. She's been out of, out of the foreign um, compassion business for her five years now. I hope she stays stateside. Now, um, yeah, all of these things. Did I, everybody? All right, anybody else now? All right, now, let's look at these things. We have race as a factor. We have polit politics as a factor in terms of it being a warring issue. We have hunger as a factor. Um, I think that there is a, I, I, I do think that all educational institutions, whether lower education or higher education, they have a moral responsibility of tending to their community somewhat. Uh, there are other institutions, such as faith institutions, that also have a responsibility. Political institutions have a major responsibility emanating out of City Hall, but still, Educational institutions do have a moral responsibility in this regard somewhat. Uh, and, and I'm happy that throughout the United States we have breakfast programs for children, we have free lunch programs for children, but that in no way uh, puts a dent in the educational process. Now, I agree, I think you all agree, that a good, substantial breakfast really helps a person who's in school. Y'all just bring so much stuff in here. <laughs> you need to have a hot breakfast. Uh, I used to tell my students at MCC, if, and on the morning of their exam, you eat a bowl of oatmeal or a hot plate of grits with some cantaloupe or grapefruit, and you drink some hot chocolate, hot coffee, or orange juice, but be sure that you feel good. 
when you leave your home to come to school if your examination is especially is in the morning and you will do much 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 better and I, I still stand by that I think that if you eat something good for breakfast it'll help you it will motivate you academically because there's a some kind of linkage I don't know what it is between your, your stomach and your brain mm -hmm. uh, and if this if this is good then this is going to be functional if this is poor if this is lacking then this is not going to function very well uh, whatever that linkage is yes I feel like that's another major problem too like nutrition and uh -huh. this idea of like food deserts uh -huh. which I only learned about this year it's like really bad because I feel like everyone should have access to healthy food yes and the uh -huh. fact that they purposely put like cheap food in these poverty areas it's like you're saying like we don't deserve to be healthy as well kind of because like they have like family dollar and it's like what why am i going to buy groceries from family dollar like what can i really get from there like but then you have like little stores like <coughs> bnl mm -hmm. which people don't notice and it's like it's because the community only sees like what's cheap and what's there and what's accessible i guess so the accessibility is a huge problem with that because the Rochester Public Market accepts SNAP benefits, mm -hmm. but you have to take RTS to get there. A lot of people that, like don't have like other forms of transportation and stuff, and that's like a huge problem because um, someone actually just did a presentation about this in my class yesterday. So um, they uh, they like they went through and like did it as if they like lived in the area and as if they didn't have a car in any other way to get there. Um, and the bus system is just not up to par. So like transportation is another big issue, like getting to like places to get better food and like, because like the 19th Ward is like a food desert and it's just, yeah. But why can't they bring it to like the church? Cause I know sometimes like in the summer they have like little market at the church. Oh, yeah. 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 And then like at the med center, I think sometimes. Yeah, there's one. They have the farmer's market. Yeah. Yeah. They're only advertising that to like the people Students, in the yeah. hospital, like who can already drive and go to Wegmans. And right. Food. Well, about that, the, so like Food Link, an organization mm -hmm. in the area, like they have like curbside markets that they like bring into a lot of these areas. So like, it's definitely not like a, you know, mm -hmm. way to fix all of it, but they, that's like one way that they try to alleviate it because they bring it to like major centers um, where they know a lot of people like wouldn't otherwise have access to fresh fruits and everything. And like I worked on one of those a bunch over the summer, and they're like very, very um, affordable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are. You get like a big bag of kale for like three dollars. Yeah, and you're eating for like two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> so but public markets are cheaper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there's a transportation problem. So. Yeah. There's some instances. All right, that doesn't help much, does it? No, no, no. But uh, well, one other question: what, what did you say about the family dollar? I wasn't sure. No, I was gonna say like you're not gonna get like quality food at places like oh, a family food, dollar. No. Yeah, and that's all that's there and that's available. Oh, I, mean, I, I thought I thought you were. Is that the one on Jet C Street? Yeah, I yeah. live across the street from there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I go there. That's I thought like, <laughs> like it's cheap, but it's not. It doesn't have anything fresh. Mm -mm. Right, it's all prepackaged, preprocessed. And once you get into the cycle of eating that kind of food, it's hard to like. Well, so on, when you see the food that you eat is very important mm -hmm. to your a food that a child eats. Very important in terms of the development of the human development of that mm -hmm. child. And because of the fact that poor people have to depend upon neighborhood stores, um, old meat. Um, old food, there's not any canned shelf life has been expired some time. That's what food link, they've created food link to kind of try to address that situation. But uh, poor people also have that uh, not too good of uh, experience in dealing with uh, these stores and uh, food and other items are just not quality. But it, uh, that's what they can afford. So you can't expect them to have T-bone steak every night. That's, that's totally mm -hmm. impossible. But you know those stores do exist, and they make a lot of money. And a lot of the things they do are illegal, and they should have a crackdown from the FDA on many of these stores 
So even though they're neighborhood, even though they're small, they can still produce quality items for the people that they serve, rather than all of this, especially this, all this, what they call soul food is just, most of that, I, I, most of that is just not good for you. It's not, it's very detrimental, whether you're a child or an adult, because it feeds into diseases that you get, uh, blood pressure disease, um, diabetic disease, uh, a lot of the foods that are eaten or consumed escalate those diseases within the human system. So they should be uh, really take, taken out and close uh, stores that continue to uh, cater to that should be closed down. But the FBI doesn't take that much of a, Miss Harper's next, uh, take that much of a stance with respect to it. I think like improving um, like nutrition prior to, I know like schools try to like educate kids on like what they should be eating or like when um, a lot of schools and especially like after school programs provide like a hot meal for the kids or like their package. I don't know, like I'm assuming it's food like, I'm trying to think of like what other places in Rochester like deliver to like these programs, but like they have like fairly like healthy choices and um, but like the kids don't want to eat that because they're not like that's not what they eat at home and like Kids will just look at it and like, like they'll like push it away or be like, I'm just gonna have some like fruit snacks when I go home. I'm like, okay, that's great. Like if you're gonna really like, and I mean that like those are like the taste they have obviously. From, like, yeah, what Miss Harper says is very important though. Vital to understand if we're teaching, for in this situation, just about all of you come in here with yogurt or something like that, and a little pail, so I'm assuming that it's yogurt or a derivative. But poor children don't eat yogurt. They don't even know what it is. So, you know, they, they're used to other things uh, that are not good for them for breakfast. One of the major things that the school district attempted to, ta attempted to tackle a long, long time ago, at least 20 years ago, was the fact that a lot of people, a lot of children have like a dollar in their pocket or two dollars in their pocket when they go to school. So they stop by one of these uh, neighborhood stores and they buy potato chips and Pepsi. And that's their breakfast. It might even be their lunch. There was a major story that uh, developed that was this black man who owned a confectionery. And he one, kept wondering why these kids were coming in, going to one of the schools about a block from where he was established, why are these children coming in buying a Pepsi Cola and a bag of, a, a dime bag of potato chips. Then, after inquiring, he learned that this was their meal. This is what they, so what he did, he closed his store, did not open it until 12 o'clock. He just extended the three hours toward the end, I think. But in that way, that was his way of saying, no more, no longer will a child um, have their diet destroyed by uh, commodities that I have at this store. And you know, he received uh, a great deal of appreciation because of that stance that he took, meaning that he was forsaking those those dimes, those, those dollars add up. Now they add up. Uh, but he was forsaking all that economy, plus other people coming in there for legitimate things uh, during that hour. But he didn't want to run the risk of, of selling things to a child that he shouldn't. Uh, if we can pass laws against a child buying beer or a child buying uh, tobacco products at a, uh, up to a certain age, then we should be able to stop inferior foods from being utilized to feed the poor. Yes. Well, I was going to say a lot of the issue with that, like, the sugar industry is just so powerful mm -hmm. and, like, the... They are. Oh, especially yeah. tobacco, right? Yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> um, I mean, it's been, like, it's worked out kind of with tobacco and alcohol to kind of getting those inhibited more on the federal level, but, like, for many, many years, the studies that have been, like, conducted about a lot of the issues of various like snacks and junk food like have been funded by you know coca-cola by other people in the industry where like they point fingers and say oh no it's not sugar it's fat that's the bad thing and they just kind of <laughs> yeah it, it just kind of like continues the cycle and they keep on um saying 
saying like, oh no, it's not us, even though like they have been found that, you know, okay, maybe it's not like as addicting as tobacco is, but like having that like constant like sugar, like it is really addicting. Um, it's like, con it's continually increasing your dopamine and it's not, like you, you just kind of, like for kids, it like is that addicting on that level, but they haven't been able to like push anything into that because push any laws through because the industry is so powerful. And there was a, um, an article of caution in one of the papers last week warning people who are drinking diet drinks to be very, very careful because they can have a very deleterious effect on your health. Um, That's what makes you want more sugar. Like your body yeah. like responds as if it's getting sugar and it's not getting sugar, so it wants sugar. And so it processes all the sugar that was in your body. Well, you know, on, on football teams, what they used to do on, right on the sidelines, is to give uh, players sugar um, chewing gum mm -hmm. to kind of get them, you know, kind of pu puffed up a little bit. Uh, I, I think they stopped that. I'm not that sure, but I know that's one way they used to get them to uh, develop the old rah rah uh, feeling. Uh, was was that, Miss Seaver? Oh, I was going to say that. Um and this goes back to the like public market thing. I wonder if the city has ever thought of providing like direct shuttles, like from like community like centers, I guess, like in each of the neighborhoods to the public market. I mean, that would be expensive, but like I don't know if any of you guys have noticed. Um, you know how on some of the buses, the RTS buses, um, they have like names on the side of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I was, you know, I was curious about that, and I looked that up. Apparently, they did that at a cost of two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars per bus wow. to put names on the buses, and I'm just like, I, I mean, I don't know if that's accurate, but it came from the RTS website, so like, uh, I would think that it would be. <laughs> and I mean, hey, that's a nice idea, but like, that money could have probably been used to, you know, like, to go off of that. Um, I think um, instead of like alternatives like that, I feel like the city has tried to work out of their like our centers and try to like bring um, like food and kind of like work out of those places. I don't know like extensively about their services, but I've been to like a few programs at like different art centers, and I feel like instead of trying to move people to other places to get resources, they try to like bring the resources there or kind of like work like within like a certain like circumference of like so like our centers yeah know. well this whole thing feeds into healthcare, mm -hmm. which is another mayor which i what can we do make me money a little bit but you know it, the whole thing of food food purchasing mm -hmm. diet mm -hmm. all it feeds into healthcare because a poor diet and a poor nutrition automatically will send you to should send you to see your doctor many poor people do not have doctors they have to depend upon clinics emergency room treatment of people who are visibly poor is not quite where it should be they're not treated with respect for one thing um, and any given weekend you can go to an emergency room of a major hospital and place will be wall-to-wall -wall poor people with some kind of grievance uh, physically but that's another thing that we, we can look at is the whole delivery of health health services to uh, the poor community. Now, last week we spent a little bit of time talking about Harlem Hospital. Um, now, Harlem Hospital has been able to really sustain itself uh, because uh, they get a few grants, but they do entertain a number of uh, graduating medical students who have declared that hospital for their internship. Uh, both uh, young white doctors to be and young black doctors to be. Uh, Harlem Hospital tends to be um, a focal point, primarily because it's a laboratory and such. You have people with all kinds of stuff coming in and you have a chance to become heroic by treating people who ordinarily would not get the kind of medical treatment uh, anyplace else. So th there, there is something going on everywhere that tends to help, but it doesn't help the community as such. Um, let, let's continue. What, what else do you see? Have we 
talked a little bit about public education, public education being very important. Um, <clears throat> we have not talked about race. We have we talked about hunger uh, and joblessness. Uh, all, all this creates uh, certain problems. They, they also create problems not only within the community, but within families as well. If we look at families that have been uh, destabilized or families moving toward destabilization as over against families who are not, we'll find out that they have something within them, uh, within that family system, whether it's employment or whether it's uh, the fact that the home does have parents in it, um, that makes it kind of able to rebound from all of this. Uh, I, I apologize, I always, because of the fact where I grew up and the time that I grew up from, from childhood is so absolutely different from today. But I can recall that when I grew up, in most of our homes, we had grandparents, especially grandmothers. And um, a lot of the pro problems that families are forced into today, impoverished families, the fact that uh, they have generally one parent, and it's usually a mother. That's all. Uh, they're, they're, the grandparent is absent. The grandparents, because you have you have two sets of grandparents, maternally and paternally, but they're, they're absent for the most part, or they're living elsewhere. And um, grandparents are essential to stability of homes. They gave parents an opportunity to go out and work. Grandparents stayed home and did the domestic thing. Uh, simply because they didn't have much of an education and the chance of them finding worthwhile employment someplace other than what they called day work was not uh, uh, that uh, encouraging. So they stayed home and uh, kept the home together, kept the home you know, intact. So we need to look at the family also as part of this whole uh, deterioration of impoverished communities. Um, people think differently. They talk differently. They understand things differently, but on some things they do not have much comprehension. One of the things that irritates a poor person is talking to people who have been educated using language of an educated person. So you're up here, but the language you're speaking comes down here and is incomprehensible. They just don't understand it. They can't understand written communication. Fire alert drill. Psychiatry, 19,000. Fire alert drill. Psychiatry, 19,000. Fire alert drill. Psychiatry, 19,000. <laughs> he even sounds a little bit. He sounds like he needs to see some uh, psychiatric person himself. <laughs> You're going to see him very enthusiastic. <laughs> Maybe he's on the night shift. He's just getting off. But you know, it's very important that written communication, every communication, be done in a language that is understandable and comfortable. I told you about the story about the big brother, uh, the big brother, the big sister program, who read a letter that the mother read about her son indicating a boy's gonna be placed in special education. And she thought that he was a special, that she had, she really understood special in the traditional way. Unique, outstanding, excellent. Didn't mean that at all. Special education means that the child's going to be monitored and is going to be restricted. And, and, and uh, if he graduates on the special education track, chances of college education are just nil. Not going to happen. Uh, so it's very important that um, the language also be very, um, very much the same. Another thing we we haven't talked about at all. I don't think just a wee bit at the early part of the, of the course. Poor people are not as spiritually um, inclined as they used to be. So church is not an option. Other religious institutions are not as strong an option as they used to be. Uh, poor people usually found a great deal of comfort, a great deal of what they call socializing or fellowship within these churches. Um, the people spoke the same language. The minister was of that same tradition, so therefore there was no uh, breakdown of communication at all, generally speaking. Uh, but that's not the case anymore. It's not. Churches used to be swarming with folk on Sunday morning. That's not the case anymore. 
so I think that the lack of faith that many poor people are now experiencing going through all these past 10, 15, 20 years has led to the uh, instance that we see, instances that we see of mental illness because most of the mental illness uh, that was actual in persons at one point who were very, very poor were addressed by the church in a way that the church was really not addressing it. Uh, but they addressed it simply by being there, being a, a channel, being some kind of conduit that uh, people could come to, where people could come to rather, and uh, vent all of the misery that they were feeling from being poor and uh, with no hope of escape from that. Did I say anything? Yes. Um, I had like two comments, I guess. Um, I think that, I guess for like the family, um, when you were talking about family stability and family disintegration, mm -hmm. um, I was thinking about attachment um, and how it's important for, for kids, young kids, to have like a fake, you know, at least one caregiver figure that's dependable mm -hmm. so that they can develop like a secure pattern of attachment. Um, and I think the problem where that comes in, you know, in especially in poor families, um, or, you know, or families that are maybe not, maybe like a little bit above the poverty level but are still struggling to make ends meet is that if they have, you know, a single parent, that parent has to work and has to leave the kids and so that attachment can't really develop in the same yes. way that it does yes. as there's some, you know, when yes. there's somebody that's always around, like a grandparent. Um, and so that probably, I think that that contributes to a lot of the stress and a lot of the, you know, like if you, I read some statistic, and I mean, I think it's true, like kids who are, grow up in poverty are more likely to develop some kind of stress-related mental illness, I guess. Yes. Um, you know, yes. because it's like, because of the trauma that it's very experience. Uh, there's a, there, there's, it's interesting that the word trauma uh, certainly does rhyme with the term drunk. And <laughs> uh, it's right there. It's traumatized. Now, um, my generation, we laugh about the fact that we didn't know we were poor until we went to college and took our first course in sociology. <laughs> hey, we were poor. We didn't know it simply because we had everything. We had everything we thought we needed growing up. You know, we're, I was never hungry in my life. I always had clothing. I never had wore, had to wear uh, secondhand clothing. Um, I had two sisters, and um, that, that was it. Uh, but um, I had a grandfather who was a tailor who worked. My dad was an insurance agent before going into the military. My mother was a trained stenographer. So we had levels of income. And my grandma, my Alabama grandmother, part of the Great Migration, yeah, she she was our, she was the cook among other things. And boy, did she hook it up. Uh, that's one of the things. The young girls today, y'all, y'all can't cook. Oh, y'all need to y'all need to take a course in cooking before you get married. I want you to take a course in cooking now. I don't want you to have your your, your mother come over and have to cook for you. Uh huh. Y'all learn how to cook. learn how to make learn how to make biscuits. Learn how to make. I'm not talking about the kind of what you know. The, you pack them on the side of the uh, sink board and they jump all over the place. Learn how to mix the milk and the flour and all of this to make biscuits. Learn how to fried chicken right, <laughs> right. Now don't don't have it bloody, yeah. yeah. But fry it right. Make sure it's well done. Well done food is better for you anyway. Yes. I think it's important that both men and women learn how to cook <laughs> so they can properly what? nourish themselves. <laughs> and if they choose to have families, so they can feed their family. Good your your days in class are over. Go. <laughs> <laughs> You're, but you're right. I know some guys are. They they want to. They want to be the cook in the family. Yeah, they do that. It, but there is. That's that's. We can place that in terms of equality. But husband and wife, uh, there 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 needs not 
there need not be this obedient fa obedience factor that is misunderstood uh, that the wife is always subject to the husband. That really shouldn't be. Husband and wives should enter into a relationship of equality, and that's the best way to be. Equality in raising children, equality in doing whatever is necessary uh, to be uh, faithful in what you discharge, faithful to your duty of, the, of, of discharge. But uh, I have to think about that quickly. I'm glad whoever, you know who it was in invented microwaves? A guy who couldn't cook. That's what it is. Yes. I was going to just touch on your point. Um, I was reading an article where they were saying that the stress of poverty is sometimes so much mentally that people can't break the cycle. Like they're always worried about their next meal or like what their child is going to wear. So yeah. it's like something with the prefrontal cortex where the stress takes over so much where it's like they can't focus on anything else. They don't know how to set goals for themselves. They don't know how to move up in a world because all the stress from poverty has consumed their lives already. Well, why is it, again, here I go, but how is it, why is it that in the 40s, 50s, and most of the 60s, crime was at a very low instance among the poor? But since the mid-60s, in my opinion, looking at and experiencing it, from the mid-60s till now, although there's been some decline the last few years, but uh, still it's way too high, why is crime activity so prevalent in the poor community? Surely crime happens everywhere. Uh, you got crooks everywhere. You got people who become impassioned and uh, take the lives of people, you have that everywhere. But I'm talking about constant, perpetual criminal activity, breaking, stealing, thefts, this, that, and the other, acts of violence. Uh, we think of Chicago and the number of young men who have been killed uh, in the course of just uh, uh, so far this year is just absolutely staggering. Uh, more people get killed in Chicago, murdered, in one month than it the whole year in Rochester, which is really, we average like 42 homicides a year. That is 42 homicides too many. There was a homicide in Rochester yeah. last night. What is it? There was a homicide in Rochester last night. And there was? Someone got shot on uh, Flanders Street in the 1940s. Oh, I haven't heard about that one. Uh, but you know what, you know, why is it that, that, that's crime? You know, that, that's what make pe makes people want to leave the area, get out, especially businesses don't want to, come in simply because they fear, one of the fears that businesses have is just that, theft, uh, robbery, uh, stick-ups. Uh, but it, you know, it seems to be overwhelming. That's good to but I also don't understand, it's like, why poor people steal from poor people? Like, you're causing trouble in your own community. You're not gonna get much. <laughs> That's what I'm saying, it's like, you have to constantly keep robbing people, beating people up, and it's like, don't you get tired of it? Like, that could be your mom or something. How many have heard of the author, professor? He goes, gets around. I think he's at Duke now. He's either at Duke. I, I think he is at Duke. I'm not sure. Michael Michael Dyson. Have you read any of his works? Well, Michael Dyson is a PhD from Yale, who is an expert in hip hop culture. So he's written a lot of books uh, defining. Uh, the essence of hip hop culture, among other things he's written, but he's a very prominent uh, face on, on television, panel discussions, whatnot. But he said, growing up in Detroit, funny story, he worked at McDonald's, and he never had any money, because he's growing up, and take his money to give to his mother, mother did with the money, but she had to do living in the Detroit project. He said, one night when he left, left McDonald's, he had $3 in his pocket. The guy jumped from behind his two parked cars and stuck him up. He said, have your money or your life. <laughs> and he had three dollars in his pocket. And he said he don't know he doesn't know what overcame him, but he upbraided the man. He said, You mean to tell me you're gonna stick me up? I work hard for this money. I don't have any job. I got three dollars in my pocket. You're gonna take all my money? And he said he 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 was so forceful and the crook looked at him. And then went to his pocket and gave him three more dollars and walked home. <laughs> <laughs> wow. and, then, and then he said when he got home, he realized what he'd done. He was shaking for an hour. 
But when you're down to your last buck, you don't want anybody to take it. No way. No way. But, uh, yeah, that, you know, that's very important that we understand that. Very important. Yeah, I, I can't, uh, yeah, I, if you're going to stick up somebody, stick up somebody who you know that got some money. But don't stick up anybody. That's the, that's the moral of the story. Uh, if you stick up somebody else, you're going to get killed. <laughs> Then we want to bring in the, you know, the relationships of poor community with police departments. I think that's very essential. I think most of the people killed by the police who were even, especially including those who were unarmed, the spate of killings that we had over the last three or four years were representatives of the poor community uh, who because of that poverty uh, made themselves very vulnerable to police interception and arrest and whatnot. Um, doesn't happen if you're not poor. If it does happen, it's a mistake. I was pulled, I've been pulled over twice, mistaken identity. I had a 1978, and this was in the 1980s, no, it's 1974, Pontiac. Vinyl top Pontiac, remember those? No, you don't. You know, your dad does, but you don't. But I had one. It was in bad shape. You know, I kept having to get in big, but I was on 490. I got pulled over by police. I said, well, I'm, something's wrong with the car. They spotted it. I was prepared to defend my car and had it. And the guy pulled a gun out on me and told me to get out of the car. Do that thing against it. What car? And my friends are driving by. They're going, ooh, ooh, ooh. Uh, and I said, oh my goodness. What happened was, a guy had murdered a guy. And it was seen escaping in a blue Cadillac with a white vinyl top. I had a blue Pontiac with a white vinyl top. The guy was black. The guy was around my age, so the guy pulled me over. And uh, really, it was giving me a hard time. And then another police cruiser came by, stopped because of the flashing lights and he and saw the gun, so he pulled down the gun. Then he recognized me. And he said, wait, wait, wait. This is the we took the name, went to what's the name? I showed my ID and whatnot. And everything was resolved. The guy, the police officer that pulled me over, kept me in his car for 15 minutes, apologizing. He was so afraid I was going to make it public. I said, no, 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 forget it. You were doing your job, but you know, you just had the wrong man, that's all. I'm not Stroke sure. team, call unit 19200. Stroke team, call unit 19200. Okay, I heard a little click. I mean, she's through. But you know what it is? It's 10, it's 14, 1014. 